Thanks, Peter. Um, and thank you for giving me an opportunity uh, to talk to the surgical grand rounds. Uh, as a physician, uh, that's always an interesting challenge, but as a cardiologist, I'm probably something of a hybrid in between the two. Um, so I think that it's always a challenge and it is um, very difficult, often difficult emotionally for <coughs> staff when something goes terribly wrong and it affects a patient. Um, never events are not at always the worst impact on patients of the errors that happen within healthcare or the complications of uh, procedures that we do every day. Uh, not all never events result in the death of a patient, for example. But I think they are things that it's very important that we learn from. And in that sense, Peter said, you know, it's disappointing to be talking about a never event, and I would certainly much prefer to be talking to you about some of the fantastic work that I know you all do every day. But I think it's also an opportunity to say we're not necessarily defined by this type of event, but we will be defined by how we respond to it. So it's probably helpful to understand what never events actually are. A lot of people think that they are particularly bad, serious incidents, and that's not the case. They are a specific list of never events that is published each year by uh, NHS England and which they define as something that is wholly preventable if you follow uh, pre-existing national guidance that has already been implemented. Uh, some people would dispute that definition and dispute the existence of some of the national guidance which uh, they rely on, but nonetheless that's their uh, definition. They have to have the potential for causing severe harm or death, although uh, in the most recent guidance, near misses are included uh, in never events. So you no longer have to have any harm caused, you just need to have nearly done it. Uh, they also have to be something that is a known risk and they have to be readily defined. I want you to bear in mind that it is possible that you are sitting near somebody who was involved in this particular never event. And therefore, I want us to particularly bear in mind the trust values. You may or may not be a fan of values. I think uh, one of the advantages of our values is that I've not yet met a person who would argue that we are here to deliver compassionate excellence. In this respect, however, I want you to consider both respect for your colleagues and compassion for those who found themselves in this situation with this particular patient and assure you that this presentation is not about blame, it is about learning and the possibilities for improvement. So, 300 years ago, Alexander Pope said, to err is human and to forgive divine. Uh, so we continue to be human and we continue uh, to regularly make mistakes. And probably somebody in the hospital is making a mistake as we speak. So as I talk about the events that happened uh, to this particular patient, um, I'd like you to reflect both on the things you do in your daily lives where you might make a mistake, but also those where you are not the problem, but you might be the solution. You might be a support to the co a colleague, the person who's really at the top of their game that day, who spots a problem and is able to remedy it. Um, I'm grateful to Peter for this slide, um, which I offer to you to make your own analysis of this uh, event as we go through. And uh, it's a framework for thinking about error and allowing us to consider those factors which might influence it. So is this, there a problem with the culture related to these events? Is it a system problem that can be fixed by changing the system? Or is there a technological problem or opportunity? So now I will take you through both the investigation and what essentially is the case presentation of this grand round in the traditional sense. So I was the lead investigator for this uh, investigation and I'm grateful to colleagues. Um, Greg Sadler supported um, the um, interviews with surgeons. Liz Wright supported the interviews with nursing staff. 
uh, and Russ Evans um, supported the anaesthetic interviews. So we've involved all of the disciplines uh, throughout this incident and carried out um, 22 hours of interviews with 15 different members of staff. So I'm going to describe to you a retained swab on a gynae oncology list that happened at the Churchill in March of this year. I'd rather you might perhaps um, didn't so much think about what the individuals uh, who were present did um, and whether they got it right or wrong, but about what you would do if you were in the same situation. So it was not a busy day. Uh, this is normally a list that runs fairly much full tilt all day long. And for various different reasons, it actually only had three patients on the list. The list was fully staffed for all the different professional groups. It had one student present, but all the rest of the staff were fully qualified. It began with the WHO briefing, which had the appropriate people present. Uh, one surgical fellow joined later in the list, but everybody else was there to find out what was going on. And the first thing which was unusual on this particular day is that the anaesthetist had had a mishap over breakfast when he managed to break his tooth on a piece of toast. So the first lesson is don't go to breakfast at his house. But his tooth was hurting and he took the opportunity near the beginning of the list to go and seek advice from a colleague uh, in an adjacent theatre. And the advice he got was in fact his tooth was quite badly broken and was likely to need to be removed. He was advised to get an urgent dental appointment and that it really needed to be done that day. So he had to then restart reorganising his day around that urgent need to get his tooth removed. And he described his position to me that he was shocked. He did uh, rapidly get a dental appointment for about 3.30 in the afternoon and he arranged for entirely appropriate cover for his clinical responsibilities in that a post-CCT fellow who is a consultant in another country uh, was due to take over the list at half past two, allowing him easily to get to his appointment. But at some point in and around the WHO briefing, uh, appropriately perhaps, this uh, uh, aspect of the day was discussed and it seems to have affected those around him in the sense that at least the nursing staff began to feel a sense of time pressure that was out of proportion to the actual workload for that particular day. So the first case, slightly unusually for this list, was a local anaesthetic patient. Not unheard of, but it was a local anaesthetic patient. And what that meant is that the anaesthetist and the ODP were not required. This facilitated the anaesthetist making the arrangement for cover and getting his dental opinion informally in Churchill theatres. And it also allowed them to send for the second patient. So they began anaesthetizing the second patient whilst the first case was going on, which is very efficient. This would be what one would commonly do, but it didn't completely take account of the position that the nursing staff felt they were in. So as the first case finished, um, before the nursing staff had started to clean the theatres, um, the second case uh, was wheeled through the doors and they had to say, no, stop, we're not ready, you have to go back into the anaesthetic room. But they described from that point onwards a reinforcement of their sense of time pressure of the list being rushed. And I think this is important because the two different disciplines within that team are now feeling different. So the surgeons were relaxed, happy, getting on with the list, pleased that it's running smoothly, and the nurses are feeling under pressure, and they haven't really managed to uh, fully understand each other's situations. So the second case uh, completes without incident. And then the third case, which is the patient who ended up, unfortunately, with a retained swab, uh, is brought into theatre. And she was due to have a laparoscopy uh, for an intra-abdominal mass uh, with a strong likelihood that it was going to proceed to total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy and omentectomy. The procedure was led by the consultant surgeon, 
and he carried out the vast majority of the procedure. It did indeed proceed to uh, open surgery as expected. After he'd finished the TAH and BSO, um, he handed over to the senior surgical fellow uh, who was present. So there, there are two fellows um, by this point. They've both worked here for <coughs> difference between months and years, um, and they're familiar to him and the team. As he makes that decision to uh, step away and hand over the end of the procedure to somebody who's appropriately skilled to do it, the clinical fellow becomes the lead surgeon. It's not completely clear who becomes the leader of the team overall. So responsibly, the consultant surgeon stays in the operating theatre uh, until uh, the omentectomy has been completed by the clinical fellow. He goes to inspect for hemostasis and is confident that all is well. And at that point, he tells the fellow that he will be in the coffee room or the changing room and that they should close up, um, but he'll be in the theatre suite. And he leaves the theatre. So at this point, the most senior person in the theatre is the anaesthetist, uh, but the, surgeon, uh, the surgical fellow is leading the operative procedure. And they then pr progress to the closing counts where we start to encounter difficulties. So the first closing count when the rectus sheath is being closed is carried out by the scrub nurse, a student ODP and the circulating nurse who is um, supervising the student ODP. They count and a swab is missing. So they call that out to the surgical fellows uh, who point to the patient's chest where a swab is sitting and they say, there it is. And they say, nope, we've counted that one. Um, and they say, are you sure? They say, yes. So you need to look in the wound and the surgical fellows do look in the wound. And after some looking, they find a swab fairly far inside uh, the abdomen and they remove it. Now, it, it is of note that in theory, when we are looking at swabs inside patients, if something is left inside, then it should be marked on the whiteboard uh, as having been left in. But uh, as a person who puts in pacemakers, um, I'm watching other people do the kind of far more erudite surgery that you all do. I think it's not uncommon for swabs when they're in use, but haven't been definitely left to temporarily pack a cavity not to be marked. But it makes us understand that in a reasonably large operation where there's a significant amount of blood loss, having a swab that gets tucked inside without anybody noticing is possible. And that is why we have counting policies. So the swab is removed. And at that point, uh, the scrub staff restart their count. And what they are doing is doing a rectification count of the first closing count. But uh, it appears that the surgical fellows may have then started to misunderstand what was going on. So once again, there is three people doing the count, the scrub nurse, the student ODP, and the experienced circulating nurse. And they count and they, they say that the swab count is correct. All of those present recollect uh, that exchange around the count is correct. However, uh, nobody knows who, whether people said the first closing count or the final closing count or the count or the closing count, allowing for the surgeons to believe that they've heard the closing count is correct uh, and they think that it is the final closing count and the scrub staff uh, are in fact describing the rectification count of the first closing count. So it's my belief as much as I can have one without having been present in the theatre at the time or having closed circuit television, which would be very handy in these situations, that at this point there is a fundamental misunderstanding and a loss of situational awareness um, between the two teams encouraged by the use of non-specific language, which is freely admitted by both uh, teams. Things then progress with the surgeons feeling implicitly confident 
that they know that their count is correct and they can close um, the patient's skin. So they ask for surgical clips uh, and uh, one of the circulating uh, practitioners hands the clips to the scrub nurse. At that point, a key opportunity to prevent uh, this error uh, is lost because the scrub nurse doesn't say anything. They're kind of trying to do several different things at once and they hand the clips to the surgeons to allow them to staple the abdomen shut. So the uh, scrub staff are aware that they have not yet done uh, their final closing count and um, they start to uh, consider that. It is ideal in our swab policy that all of the counts are done by the same people, but that is not what happens on this occasion. Um, and the scrub nurse is by this point getting quite significantly distracted. It's important to consider the makeup of the two teams, perhaps. So we have two fellows who are used to working together who are using a particularly rapid method to close the abdominal skin. So staples. The scrub staff, um, the scrub nurse admits that on this particular day, uh, his trolley was somewhat messy. Um, the red uh, tags that go round the swabs had got tangled up with each other and they have to count the red tags to know how many swabs they're supposed to be counting. So there was a certain amount of reorganisation going on. And the student ODP, uh, in, in really a very honest and open interview, admits that they were likely the cause of a particularly slow count. So it is more understandable that the surgical team think a significant amount of time has passed before they get the reassurance that the count is correct and have assumed that it's the final closing count. There is also a lack of understanding on part of one of the fellows who believes that when you do the final, the first closing count, now I'm doing it, uh, when you do the first closing count, all that is counted are the swabs and then everything is counted at the end. Whereas in fact, our policy is that for the first closing count, you count all of the swabs and all of the instruments, which of course takes a longer period of time than simply recounting five or 10 swabs. So, so there is a, a lack of understanding. And at this point, the um, scrub staff are going particularly slowly and the surgeons are going reasonably fast. So once the uh, skin has been closed, the, one of the um, experienced nurses uh, is asked to put the light end of the table back in. The patient is in Lloyd Davis position with their legs up. And they realise that they've actually lent the light end of the table uh, to another theatre because they don't have one per theatre. So she has to go next door and get it. And when she goes next door, it's actually in use. So she then has to make her way round each of the theatres at the Churchill until she finds a light end uh, that is not in use and she brings it back to the theatre. And I mention that not because she was now part of the counts, but because when I interviewed her, she was a particularly impressive individual, very familiar with theatres, very familiar with this list. And I think if she had been present throughout, uh, there is a much greater likelihood that with her experience she would have had an awareness of the whole situation and would, got, would have gone to her less experienced scrub colleague and said, excuse me, where is the last count? Stop. But that did not happen. I think also that although in our counts policy the anaesthetist is not responsible for counts, it is the responsibility of the surgeon to foster the right environment of the counts, uh, and ensure that they know what the result is. I think often the anaesthetist is looking at a large number of factors that are going on in this kind of situation uh, and taking that oversight role while the surgeon is rightly concentrating on the test technical aspects of the surgery. And I think in this respect, but in this respect only, the injury to the surgeon, to the anaesthetist's tooth may have had an effect because when they were interviewed, they said that they were unaware that there had been a swab missing on the first closing count. And as I say, it's not their responsibility, 
but it did suggest to me that they were in fact more distressed, more distracted uh, than perhaps they or their colleagues had realised. And it's another opportunity lost uh, for someone else to uh, spot the disconnection between the teams and then beginning to start as, uh, to act as individuals. So at this point, uh, the anaesthetist recalls asking the surgical team if the operation was over and he could wake the patient. Uh, the clinical fellows don't remember him saying that, um, but acknowledge that there is such a degree of automaticity in that kind of uh, conversation that it's possible that it happened and they've forgotten. So the anaesthetist starts to work the, wake the patient, and in the very early stages of that, the patient starts to move on the table, um, not fully rousing, but some leg movements. And it's one of those moments when suddenly everyone who's still in the theatre rushes to the table to try and stop the patient from falling off. Um, and the scrub nurse turns around, sees this, and becomes completely distracted from his possibly more important task of counting the swabs. Um, so he now realises that the surgeons who have completed their closure have descrubbed and started writing up their operation note. He is now the only person who's sterile in the theatre. So he sees his prime uh, responsibility as protecting the wound, which doesn't have a dressing on it, um, and making sure that the drapes don't fall off until the patient's position has been secured. So he starts to hold on to the drape, asks for a dressing, puts the dressing on. Um, and by doing that, he sends multiple nonverbal signals to his colleagues that, in fact, we're at a much later stage in the operation and, and um, his progress through the counts than, he, than um, he really was. And at no point through this time does he say, stop, I haven't done my final closing count, even though he's aware that it hasn't happened. And that is definitely another important opportunity lost. So uh, at this point, he gets one of the um, uh, theatre support workers to come and count with him. And they go through the swab count and they realise that a swab is missing. Now, people have very different recollections of how long after uh, the skin closure this actually was. Some people think it was about five minutes. Some people think it may have been as long as 15 minutes. Um, I don't think it's unusual that people have very different recollections. This is very common in this kind of investigation. Uh, in stressful situations, you tend to co concentrate on your bit um, and you're not sitting there clock watching. But there is no doubt that this final closing count happened very late. So they find the swab is missing and they sing out, uh, my count doesn't reconcile, we have a swab missing. Turn round to find that the patient is being moved from the table onto a bed um, and there is disagreement about whether the patient was still had their endotracheal tube in. So it was either in or about to be removed. Uh, and at this point, it really is almost too late. So they then have a discussion around what to, what to do uh, with this difficult situation of a patient on a bed um, who is somewhat awake. And at this point, they didn't go back to what policies and procedures are. They didn't ask the surgical consultant to come back, which I think might have made a difference. But the anaesthetist takes on the responsibility of being the most senior member of staff in the room. And despite the fact that the scrub nurse said, I don't think we should leave the room, we have a swab missing, the anaesthetist took the view that uh, having a patient who had no monitoring on them anymore, and the monitoring was on the floor, in a theatre that in his view was used or dirty, that it was not in the patient's best interest to remain in the theatre. Th this aspect is highly contested. Uh, the anaesthetist supporting the investigation felt that that was reasonable. Others feel that it was uh, a fatal flaw. Um, I think for me, uh, the important thing is that the anaesthetist's decision to let ha take the patient out of theatre at that point uh, changed whether this would be classified as a never event or not. Uh, 
but it didn't change the fundamental impact on the patient, which is that they had had a swab left inside without our checks and balances identifying it. So never, the never event status, the adverse <coughs> reputational impact, you know, it's difficult. It means that people like Tony and I end up in uh, having to answer to a lot of regulators. And there's no doubt that, that it carries a, a stigma for the team involved and, and causes distress. But the important thing is the error that happens to the patient, uh, not whether we get labelled with something or not. So I think that the retention of the swab is much more key uh, to this uh, particular event. So the anaesthetist decides that the patient will be moved into the recovery area. And he also makes a decision that the sign out procedure will not be completed um, on the grounds that they can't sign out that all is well because it isn't. Um, and he decides uh, that they will not fill out any documentation uh, related to the missing swab because they can't complete a sign out. Uh, I think that is poor practice myself. The scrub nurse did document uh, that a swab was missing, although the documentation is not signed or dated, uh, which is slightly poor practice. The patient is then moved into recovery area and uh, the surgical fellow goes to inform the consultant surgeon and requests uh, an X-ray of the abdomen. Uh, an extra plain film is taken and it identifies a swab left in the patient's abdomen. She is fully awake by this point and is consented for a return to theatre to have the swab removed. I would say as an aside, um, because of the stress of the situation, it would appear that we forgot about her family and her husband and daughter were waiting uh, in a waiting area adjacent to theatres um, and they thought that she had had some kind of um, much more complicated surgical event because they were expecting her to be gone for a certain period and she was gone for about two hours longer than that. Uh, and they have, uh, in their feedback, said that it would have been really important to them that somebody had come and told them what was going on and that there were two procedures because um, particularly her husband, who is disabled, um, had unnecessary worry. So I think in terms of good practice, the team remembered to do a plain film. Um, swabs can be missed on screening with c arms, so our policy is really clear around doing plain films. Um, there was a clear explanation to the patient. There was no attempt to hide the events that had gone on. And the uh, retention of a swab uh, was declared to the medical director within an hour of the team uh, being made aware. So there, there was absolute candour, openness and honesty in that respect. I can't tell you how that swab came to be retained. I think that there are two possibilities. So one is that when the first closing count was done, there were in fact two swabs missing and three people miscounted. One swab was then removed from the patient and three people miscounted again. So there is in some literature about a 17% error rate on counts. Um, I think it's slightly less likely to happen when you have three people rather than two, which we happen to have in this count because there was a student present. Um, but it seems a bit unlikely. The th second possibility uh, is that the surgical team who were doing the closure accidentally reintroduced a swab that managed to work its way down into a paracolic gutter uh, during the actual closure. Now, some people do use a technique where you put a swab over the bowel to protect it. Both of the fellows were aware of that technique, but did not believe they had used it on this occasion. And we're talking about quite a big swab. So it, that doesn't seem very likely either that, that they managed to lose a great big thing like that when all they were doing is closing um, the rectus sheath. But what I do know is that swabs don't jump. So somewhere along the line, another swab has to have got lost 
bloody forgotten and, and worked its way down into the pericolic gutter and got lost. But I don't think we will ever be able to fully resolve how that swab ended up where it did. So I wanted you to think about the culture that we work in. Three examples of culture have been the no blame culture, the just culture. Jeremy Hunt has now coined the honesty culture. Um, one of the speakers that Helen and Peter have had to one of their human factors um, lectures uh, has said that the just culture is just an excuse for blaming people. Um, but you can reflect on what you feel most comfortable with as a person because it will be what you enact which creates that culture. So I wanted to just run through some of the care and service delivery problems and the contributory factors here. So I think that the surgical and anaesthetic team uh, obviously completed the surgery prior to the final count. The scrub nurse was distracted by the patient's movements and an opportunity to tell the surgical team that the final count had not been done was lost. It's important to recognise that interpersonal relationships were usually good on this particular list but at the same time, the teams lost situational awareness and they started to act as individuals, not a team, particularly with a disconnection between the surgeons, the scrub nurse and the anaesthetist. I think there are underlying issues that there is no systematic training uh, or assessment of understanding in the counts policy in place for the surgical and anaesthetic team, whereas the, so the theatre staff who take part in counts have to pass an annual uh, MCQ test and uh, have a specific session with the practice <coughs> development team in theatres and that is an extremely robust process. It's also a small factor the operating theatre had loaned its short end to the adjacent theatre meaning that an important member of staff was absent from the theatre when it happened. I think that contributory factors are that we use non-specific language for counts um, I've mentioned the lack of familiarity with uh, medical staff with the counting of swabs policies, but I think we all know that policies are all very well, but they only work if we actually uh, feel them and live them. Um, that the nursing staff perceived that there was a significant time pressure on the list due to the rapid changeover of patients and their awareness of the anaesthetist's need to leave the theatre. I would add that the person who was covering the anaesthetist uh, arrived about five minutes after all this had happened at exactly the time he was expected. So there's never a lack of an anaesthetist in real life. Um, there was no clear leader of the team um, once the consultant surgeon left the room. And I think that the anaesthetist uh, stepped in and one kind of bias within this situation is a pressure to make a decision extremely quickly, which I think is what happened here. I don't think there was much awareness in the wider team that the count was going particularly slowly. And I've noted that the, stru the scrub nurse was distracted. This can be referred to as a decoy phenomenon and their feeling that they needed to keep the sterile field and put the dressings on took them away from their more important activity of doing the count. And I think it's worth reflecting that about a year before this, there were three retained swabs over 12 months in the Churchill theatres. There's been a huge cultural effort and um, Mark Stoneham's at the back has been a very key part of that. Um, and I think the team has made a great deal of progress but not quite enough for this particular type of error to, to be avoided. Um, but please don't underestimate the real concern and upset that this um, uh, event has had with the team. And I've given uh, this presentation to the theatre staff in their audit day about a week ago. So I think the root causes here are that the patient's skin was closed and the operation was finished prior to the final closing count being conducted due to the surgical team mistakenly believing that they'd been told the final closing count was complete and correct. That this resulted from a failure to follow the swab counting policy, including the sign out of the WHO checklist. And it relates in part to training and familiarity of the surgical team, 
which was one of the things that was supposed to be implemented after the first of the previous NEVER events. I think there's also a factor that we think that the WHO and swab counting is the same in every organisation and the surgeons felt very confident that they knew what the nursing staff were doing but in fact they, they had slightly different views. So before I come to the recommendations, which I'd also like your views on, um, I'm just going to say a few words about NEVER events overall. And these are the NEVER events that happened in 2014-15 in England. And as you can see, there were 308, which I think might call into question the use of the term never event. Um, there are those who feel that it is unhelpful. Um, and and I, to some degree, I would agree with them. In terms of the different types, 126 wrong site surgeries and 102 retained foreign objects. So at least a third of, of these never events are retained foreign objects like this one. So we are not alone in struggling with this problem. I'm not going to go through all of them, you'll be glad to hear. Within the retained um, foreign objects um, for that year, uh, there were 31 vaginal swabs and 16 surgical swabs. There is then a long list which carries on, as you can see, single guide wires. Not quite sure how they had never event where they didn't know what they'd left inside, but I assume it was discovered at a later date and was not possible to identify what it was. Um, but there are also parts of instruments, trocars, etc. I wanted to say a word about never events that we've had in the last 12 months um, at OUH. So we've removed two wrong teeth. Um, in each case, they were either removed from the top of the jaw rather than the bottom of the jaw, or from the right-hand side rather than the left-hand side. So just to be clear, this isn't two, two grotty teeth or two normal teeth next door to each other and counting to the wrong one. It's a, it's a true sidedness change. We've had wrong level spinal surgery. Um, I would highlight that there is a national debate going on about wrong level spinal surgery and whether it, there is in fact any technique that can truly prevent it. Personally, I would be very supportive of that and that is um, in large part the conclusion of the report that was done by my colleague Ivor Byron. <coughs> We've also very recently had a patient who went to a child who went to IR for removal of a portacath um, and they had a complex history with pre, uh, genetic syndrome that predisposed them to cancer, had chemotherapy, and four years before, the consultant doing the procedure had put a port cath in with the port about here. They had a very hypertrophied scar, and they made an assumption that that was the port cath that needed to be removed uh, this was in part based on the fact that they used to put in all the portacaths, so kind of felt they knew every single patient. In fact, uh, while that consultant was um, on a period away from the hospital, this portacath had malfunctioned, been removed more than a year before, and they now had a portacath where the port was sitting in the axilla. But before using any of the screening, any of the imaging available, they made an incision here, uh, and looked for the portacath, which of course was not there. Um, ultimately, the correct side was identified and the portacath removed, and that's currently under full investigation. We've also recently had a uh, wrong site approach um, to do a craniectomy in a patient who had uh, a uh, an intracranial bleed that was large, it was very emergent to, ha to have the surgery, and even though the whole of the WHO checklist was done talking about the correct side, when the patient was positioned on the table, the wrong side was prepared, three burr holes were put in, and they were just about to start lifting um, the cranium when the consultant uh, walked in and joined the surgical team and said, I think there's something wrong, stop. And uh, although that doesn't constitute preventing the never event, their single action and intervention definitely prevented that having a massive harm to the patient. So the bone flap was never lifted uh, and they went on to do the correct operation on the correct side. We've also had uh, retained foreign objects in terms of a midline guide wire when a nurse was putting in a line for cystic fibrosis on a ward, uh, had difficulty with the procedure, thought they'd removed the guide wire with the line when they pulled it out. 
but the patient subsequently went on to have uh, significant pain in the arm and returned a few weeks later. Uh, it was ultrasounded and it proved that there was a guide wire inside. And we've had this retained swab and another retained swab uh, that happened a few weeks ago at the NOC, uh, where a patient was having quite a complicated procedure uh, with two surgical teams to move the gracilis muscle into another part uh, of the patient's other leg. And um, the swab count came out wrong. And at the end of um, the procedure, it was uh, decided to do screening with a C-arm, which doesn't fit the policy, it was very well intentioned, uh, and it appears that the screening with the C-arm was done such that the, the area closest to the knee was omitted, so the bottom of the leg was screened and the top of it was, but the swab was close enough to the knee that it wasn't seen, or else it's the issue that the resolution of C-arms is not good enough. Uh, so the team concluded that the swab had not been retained and it, they must have lost it somewhere and the patient was, which was not a decision they took lightly. A patient went to recovery, had a plain film, which showed that the swab was still there and went back to theatre. I think perhaps the worst and ever event that we've had is a misplaced NG tube, which happened out of hours at the Horton in a patient who was very ill with catatonic depression. And they had uh, an NG tube put in um, by the nursing staff. They couldn't get an aspirate. Um, they took an x-ray of the patient uh, and an FY1 who was somewhere else in the hospital was asked to read it remotely through the PAC system. So they were too busy to come to the ward. Um, they made an error at that point in thinking that the tip of the NG tube was in the stomach. And apologies, I should have put the x-ray up. It's quite fun to see uh, in an awful way. Um, and the tip is here. But what you can tell, and so it looks as though it's over the stomach bubble, but if you look at it, the passage is straight across down the left main bronchus and out into the lung parenchyma, and it's simply overlying. Uh, now, the FY1 had not had uh, any substantial training on how to interpret those films or <coughs> so a, a more explicit instruction that if they were not sure, um, they should seek advice. And I think it's fair to say that that's been a a truly terrible experience for them as a very new doctor. And um, there's a real risk that in that kind of situation, one will lose someone to the profession. Um, the patient died the following morning, having been fed um, in the normal way straight into their lung with no particular cough reflex, which can happen. So this year's never events. You may be pleased to hear after all this sort of distress that there are rather fewer never events now. Uh, only 14, a large number of them have been removed from the list, partly because it's not clear that you can prevent them, which is, I think, a step in the right direction. And I wanted to particularly highlight uh, wrong site surgery, wrong implant or prosthesis, and retain foreign object, uh, because they, uh, unfortunately, are things that are a risk for all of you when you go through your daily lives in the respect of surgery. There isn't a huge evidence base uh, around this area. Um, this is a study of 772 never events that happened over five years and was looked at by the Joint Commission in the States. And what they highlighted around likelihood of retained foreign objects was the absence of policies and procedures, uh, a failure to comply with existing policies and procedures, problems with hierarchy and intimidation, failure in communication with physicians, failure of staff to communicate relevant patient information, and inadequate or incomplete education of staff. Sounds a bit familiar. Um, there's two other um, aspects that have also been looked at by this paper on the um, left-hand side in Annals of Surgery in another report from the Joint Commission. And that was that retained foreign objects are more likely to happen uh, if the surgery is complex, particularly if there is this, um, a number of different teams and a longer duration. They actually highlighted a number of changes in nursing teams in that particular statement. If the surgery is emergent or urgent, I think that takes us back to the wrong site cranial surgery. Uh, and I've seen that happen at Queen Square as well when I was working at UCLH. Uh, surgical teams fatigue and workload. Uh, 
And it's also understandable that if you operate in a big cavity like the abdomen, you might be more likely to lose something than I hope I would in a little pacemaker wound. That's jinxed it forever. Um, patients with high BMI have crevices in which to hide things. Once again, if the surgery was emergent or urgent in the Joint Commission's view, you are nine times more likely to have a retained foreign object. If there's a sudden change to the procedure, that can make this more likely. If there's more than one surgical team, so you don't have the personal human memory of where you put things. If there's an unexpected finding or development, or if there's, there's a change of team for whatever reason. There is also, of course, the huge world of human factors, which given that we have both Peter and Helen here as great human factors expert, I was going to say as little about as possible, in fact, nothing, and they may wish to comment. But I hope I've, um, in painting the picture of what happened in this event, uh, you've considered some of the reasons why, um, when everybody comes to work to do a good job, to make patients better, these problems can still happen. So quickly to talk to you about the recommendations. So what um, we've uh, agreed with um, the relevant clinical directors, divisional directors, sign out WHO checklist should be carried out as the skin is being closed and prior to the patient having reversal of anesthesia and that that needs to include a three-way confirmation between the surgeon, scrub nurse and anaesthetist that the operation is over and the patient can be woken that all surgeons and proceduralists should receive training on swab count policy and have to sign a record to say they're fully aware of its contents. For inspir experienced staff, that might just be reading it and signing it. But for new medical staff, we need to have um, an induction into each of the theatre suites, um, which uh, when they start at OUH, which needs to include checklist familiarity, culture in theatres, and a familiarity with the swab counting policy. Currently, we induce medical staff into their own subspecialty far away from theatres, uh, and they may then get told where the changing rooms and where the locker is, but we don't, we don't actually have somebody walk them round, and the practice development team who do this for the nursing staff are phenomenal in my view. Uh, the counting swabs policy needs to be reviewed to include the use of unambiguous language to refer to specific counts. Of course, we can rewrite as many policies as we like, and that will, things will only change if you buy into what we write into them and decide to uh, follow them in your daily lives. Um, the, the gynae oncology and associated theatre team should attend bespoke human factors training, uh, and we would encourage all of the teams as much as possible to um, uh, go on the human factors training. This is not a punishment, this is an opportunity. Uh, and that theatres should ensure that there are sufficient light ends of tables and indeed other equipment to avoid the need to share them between theatres. I wanted to particularly thank everyone who was interviewed as part of the investigation and also the investigation team who supported me uh, and Katie Holmes from Churchill Theatres, who is a rather junior administrator who sat with me through all these interviews and was incredibly thoughtful um, and wise uh, and it's a credit to the Trust. So I hope that the rest of your day is involved with curing patients uh, and being a good team member, and I thank you for everything you'll do. And um, This is a tiny part of uh, an enormous benefit that people of Oxfordshire get from everything that you do uh, as doctors. So uh, have a nice day. Thank you very much.